Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. So today we're going to talk about a very, very, very important underspoken of topic in the metabolic space, <clears throat> in the ketogenic metabolic space, and that is sleep apnea. Now, sleep apnea is not just uh, the most severe form that everybody knows, but Difficulty sleeping, difficulty breathing while you sleep affects every system in your body, particularly your lungs, your lungs and your heart and your brain. So it's very, very important to understand this. And in my opinion, everybody should be tested, even lean people should be tested at least once to see what your sleep pattern is, to see what effect sleeping has on your oxygenation, on your breathing pattern. If it's normal, hey, Badge of honor, I'm great. Um, and I've tested mine and it's normal. If, however, you have issues, you've then got to decide to what extent are they affecting you. So uh, in the next video, we're going to talk about sleep patterns and, and how to get to sleep better, how to prevent yourself from waking up while you're sleeping, uh, how to get back to sleep, quality of sleep. But <clears throat> what is sleep apnea? Well, obviously sleep is when you fall asleep, when your brain's resting. Um, apnea literally means stopping breathing, pauses in breathing. That's what apnea is. And the problem when you pause breathing for a longer period of time, anywhere above 10 seconds, is oxygen delivery from your lungs to your, uh, um, to your bloodstream, that interface as the oxygen concentration decreases in your lungs, oxygenation is affected. And most people, when they think about breathing, they think about oxygenation. And that's important. However, what's even more important, what's even more important is that the lungs are also a waste disposal system for carbon dioxide. So when we breathe oxygen, the oxygen goes to our cells, it's used in metabolic processes, and then the cells release carbon dioxide. And for the most part, we have to breathe out. We can pee a little bit out, but most of it is breathed out. And if you are not breathing rapidly enough, that carbon dioxide can't diffuse into the air that we're going to breathe out, and it sits in the bloodstream. And very rapidly, what is carbon dioxide? Slightly, we call it hypercapnia. What does higher levels of carbon dioxide do in the, in the bloodstream? It decreases, for those of you who are a bit geeky, it decreases the pH. And the blood's pH is very, very, very tightly controlled around 7.4. So any acidosis, any reduction in that pH, even fractional measures of, of reduction affect blood flow, affect the, affect the size and the volume and the flow of those blood vessels and blood to your organs, particularly while you're asleep, the heart and the brain, and then if you've eaten the gut. But acidosis is a big issue. Oxygen delivery is also a big issue. So even short pauses in breathing, even a reduction in the airflow and the air movement, the air stream, because it's not just where you're not breathing. But if I take a deep breath like that, I'm getting a large volume of air exchange with a very, very small residual volume left in my lungs. But if I'm taking a shallow breath or if my breathing is partially obstructed, I'm not moving. I'm just kind of doing this and I'm not adequately moving that air. I'm not adequately oxygenating or adequately getting the CO2 in, and I'm actually rebreathing that air. You know, when someone's having a panic attack, you put a brown paper bag on their face, and they breathe CO2 to calm themselves down. Well, if you're not breathing properly while you're asleep, if there's collapse of the soft tissues of your face or of your pharynx into your airway, and you're obstructing slightly, you're rebreathing that CO2. So not only are you not getting rid of it, you're rebreathing it. And that's not good for you. That's not a good thing. So that's what sleep apnea is. It's decreased oxygenation, but also decrease in CO2. It's poor ventilation. And there's an oxygen and a carbon, carbon dioxide mismatch going to the bloodstream. And especially if you're living at elevation, if you're living in Colorado or in the Rocky Mountains or at any place elevation, my wife went to school in Laramie in Wyoming at 7,000 feet. The partial pressure of oxygen is radically lower. 
So yes, you may have a little bit higher hemoglobin, you have better oxygen carrying capacity, but any apnea you have at elevation makes a big difference. Or if you're a coastal person like myself who lives at uh, sea level, I may be okay here, but if I go to elevation, I go for a trip somewhere and I go to elevation, my breathing suffers, my brain suffers. So understanding sleep apnea, understanding airway movement is very, very important. And in particular, think about this. We're obsessed about doing CAC scores <clears throat> because CAC scores tell us about plaque buildup in the blood vessels of the heart. So if you've got type 2 diabetes, if you've got plaque buildup in your heart, if you're a smoker, you get narrowing of the heart vessels. Now, you may not be symptomatic at sea level or at rest, but if you're asleep, and you have a little bit of apnea. Now you've got two things going on. You've got slightly higher CO2 levels, which causes a narrowing of those blood vessels. You've also got too little oxygen in the bloodstream, and it's flowing across a piece of plaque where it's a rough edge, there's turbulent flow, or a narrower area. And while your heart may, your heart muscle may be getting adequate blood flow while you're awake, just a slight decrease in that blood flow, in that oxygenation to the heart, may cause a heart attack. And it also may affect the nerves to the heart and cause or exacerbate an arrhythmia. So if you've had an ablation for atrial fibrillation, kumbaya, I'm back in sinus rhythm, you got hypoxia, you got poor sleeping, boom, you flip back into atrial fibrillation. Or you have abnormal heartbeats or palpitations. So there's a tremendous cardiovascular effect. The other problem with, the, uh, um, uh, with sleep apnea or a lack of oxygenation and carbon dioxide removal is in the brain. The brain has very, very specific receptors for carbon dioxide. The brain, even the sleeping brain, it's still working. It's very, very sensitive to elevated levels of CO2. And as soon as that CO2, when you're not breathing properly, when you've got some apnea, as soon as that CO2 goes to the brain, you're not breathing adequately, your brain senses that, and guess what it does? It says, dude, he's not moving air adequately, and it wakes you up. It wakes you up. So you take a deeper breath. So you're waking up multiple times a day, uh, multiple times a night with sleep apnea. You're not getting into REM sleep. You're not getting good sleep. And the problem with that is when you wake up in the morning or when you get out of bed in the morning, you're exhausted and then you're falling asleep in the day and you've got brain fog because your brain hasn't had adequate rest and, and you're just miserable. So sleep apnea has multiple ramifications. It affects your mood, it affects your ability to concentrate, gives you that brain fog, you fall asleep, there's a risk of falling asleep while you're driving or you're standing at a, at a traffic light and or behind a school bus and you fall asleep. It can get really ugly, folks. And you don't know that you have sleep apnea. Why not? <laughs> the reason you don't know you have sleep apnea directly is because you're asleep. So unless you videotape yourself or unless you have a family member or a friend that tells you, whoa, dude, you, don't, you stop breathing or you're snoring or you're choking or you're gasping when you wake up, you're not aware of it. You're not aware of it. And I mean, the statistics, folks, I'm going to read them to you. They're pretty astounding. One in 10 people have moderate to severe, one in 10 Americans have, one, uh, uh, have moderate to severe sleep apnea. Even young people, even overweight, diabetic adolescents and, and young adults. So it's not just, it is more common in older people, but it's seen in young people. 30%, one in three people over the age of 60 have moderate to severe sleep apnea. The male to female frequency is two to one. But, but think about that. That's a lot of people out there that don't even know they have the problem. So, so how do we figure this out? How do we figure this out? And I'm going to talk a lot more about sleep apnea in a little bit and also the other impact. And certainly if you've, if you've got metabolic syndrome, you've got metabolic health, if you've got diabetes, if you've got obesity, if you're more than 20 to 30 pounds overweight, especially if you've got truncal central obesity, that's why the males have more kind of the jowls. And the, that, as soon as you fall asleep, those soft tissues relax, they collapse down your airway, and they partially obstruct you. And the way, to, the way to figure this out, the only way to really figure this out, to see the severity, and then 
to be recommended certain treatments if you choose to. Obviously, the best treatment is to get rid of the cause, lose the weight, get rid of the insulin resistance, get rid of the diabetes. Um, and we're talking about obstructive sleep apnea now. I'll talk about central sleep apnea in a little bit. But the best way to do this is to get tested. And this is the problem, folks. This is the problem, is that in order to get tested traditionally, you have to make a, uh, an appointment with a sleep lab. You take your little teddy bear and your stuffed pillow and you go in to a sleep lab overnight and you have to sleep and they wire you up and they hook you up and they, they do a very, very, very sophisticated test that gives us all these metrics. Great, fantastic. And then they can, they can tell you, yeah, you've got mild, moderate or severe sleep apnea. And the requirement is... Uh, no airflow, stopping breathing for more than 10 seconds, so a 90% reduction in uh, breathing for more than 10 seconds, more than five episodes an hour is severe sleep apnea, or when your saturation drops below more than 4% from the baseline while you're awake. So those are the metrics, and, and, and those aren't difficult things to measure. In the sleep labs, they give you so much more information but it's a pain in the ass to have to make this appointment. It's expensive. It's a whole night out of your day, if I can put it that way. Um, and, and so a lot of people don't get tested. Either they don't want to wear the equipment, they don't want to know, or it's just an uphill climb. I, I came across these guys. It's called Sleep Doctor. Okay. And um, I went online. I found them. Uh, and they sent me this little device. Okay. Now, this is a new device. I've used this already. Um, and it's so cool because it gives you all the information you need and all the information they need. Now, they are a doctor, a physician-run company. So the way it works is when you apply to them, you put the application in, you actually have a short visit, you fill out a questionnaire, you have a short visit with a doctor, telling them what your symptoms are, telling them a little bit about yourself. Um, they send you this device, and it's pretty cool. I'll show it to you over here. What the device is... And everybody knows what this is. That's an oxygen saturation monitor, a little bit more sophisticated than the typical one that you use. But you sleep with that on. It's got a little wristband. And then it's got a probe that goes on your chest to measure your chest movements. I'm not going to do that. That sticks on your chest, just like an EKG lead sticks on your chest. This guy goes on your wrist, measures your oxygenation. Uh, sorry, this guy measures the oxygenation. This guy measures your heart rate. Uh, it's a little EKG monitor. So this little kit that they send to you to use at home, oh, it even comes, the, the noisy thing here is a handy dandy little battery, so it's battery operated. But this does a couple of things. First of all, you wear it in your own bed, which is obviously where you're going to be most of the time. Um, it gives you a very, very simple way to test yourself at home. You can test yourself multiple times if you want to, but it gives you real world conditions. And it provides the company all the information that you need. It's sent to them. They can then analyze that and give you a score and give you a recommendation. Do you have mild, moderate to severe sleep apnea? Do you not have sleep apnea? Do you have central sleep apnea, which we're going to talk about in a second? Do you have obstructive sleep apnea? And what are their recommendations? So just like we do something called a CAC score, and I would urge everybody to get a coronary artery calcium score to look at your plug, even if it's a zero. Hey, I've got a zero. Even if you don't have sleep apnea, hey, I don't have sleep apnea, I'm fine. If I snore, it's because I drank too much or I, I was exhausted, but it's okay to have that every now and then. But if you do have it, now you know it, and then you can decide what you want to do about it. Same thing with the CAC score. You can go and get a CT angiogram or a cardiac catheterization, which is like going into a sleep lab overnight. But you don't need to do that. If your CAC score is zero, you're good to go. Same thing here. So these are tests that I'm going to strongly recommend to my patients. And the reason I haven't recommended it a lot lately or, or with my patient population is because I personally am not going to go into a sleep lab overnight. It's just too cumbersome. It's a little bit like if you don't have a lot of risk, having a colon test done, which is where you send poop to a laboratory, and then if it comes back positive, you have the colonoscopy, I want everybody's colon to get tested, but you don't, not everybody needs a colonoscopy. If you don't want to go that route, at least get a colon done. And we prescribe those in our office all the time. So that's kind of the way I look at this. Uh, sleep doctor, if you look in the show notes, you'll see all their information. I love this device and I trust them. Okay? But this is not an ad for sleep doctor. This is a discussion about sleep uh, apnea. 
And the most important thing for my patients is to get tested for sleep apnea. I'm totally fine with you going to a laboratory and getting the high-end test done. But I also, if you're not prepared to do that, I also want you to get tested at home to know the severity, not just whether you have it or not, but the severity. And once, once you have that testing, you and I can talk. And you can say, okay, I tested positive. These are my scores. We can then talk about strategies. And certainly in my practice, the two major strategies are to steepen the weight loss curve if you're still carrying excess weight and there's a lot of jowls here. The second one is to aggressively treat your insulin resistance. If you're still significantly insulin resistant, if you still have type 2 diabetes, those are the two factors that we have to treat aggressively. But then we can also look for LPR, laryngopharyngeal reflux, video coming up. We can look at coronary artery vascular disease. We can look at sleep patterns. We can look at all of those things as part of your consultation with me as a metabolic health specialist. So um, when we look at, this, at, at sleep apnea, one of the things is the soft tissues of your mouth and of your face collapse down. And the one thing I absolutely do not want you to do at a, as a starting point, it may be very rarely as an endpoint, but I see a number of patients who come to me who have already had surgery. And I would tell you that is the last thing you should be doing. Has it, does it, is it valid for some people? Yes, but I've seen a lot of people where it didn't help. They go through this miserable surgery. It affects that, that airway tremendously. But if we can help you to clean out your sinuses so you can breathe better through your nose and your mouth, if we can get you to decrease your tonsil size, get rid of the acid reflux that may be coming back up to your throat and causing inflammation, if we can get you to lose some weight, if we can treat your insulin resistance, that ultimately reduces or gets rid of the problem. In the meanwhile, sleep doctor or the sleep lab may be recommending a CPAP, the Darth Vader mask, which I totally support if you have moderate to severe sleep apnea. Because if you do have that, you've probably got cardiac compromise and we don't want you getting a heart, uh, a heart problem. And certainly, if you're going to travel, if you live at sea level or low, low elevation, and you're going to travel to high elevation, that's where you also may need to be treated. You may need that CPAP while you're sleeping because hypoxia at altitude is a problem. In the next video, I'm going to talk in detail in detail about estrogen. But if you're a woman in that perimenopausal, menopausal era, and, and I, I am apologizing to every woman that I've managed so far, because I've just recently had this aha moment, is that estrogen is not just a gynecologic hormone. Estrogen has multiple, multiple other effects. Estrogen, there are estrogen receptors on male and female brain cells. And it doesn't affect males that much because our estrogen levels, even though they're low, they're continuous. But females going through menopause, boink, rapid reduction in estrogen. And if you're not on hormonal replacement, which we're going to talk about in another video, fatigue, lack of sleep, poor sleep, sleep apnea, uh, sleep disturbance are all massive in that 50, 50 year age group, that perimenopausal age group. And if you have a little bit of sleep apnea as a background, that makes that brain fog, it makes the sleep disturbance, it makes your exhaustion so much worse. So yes, we may need to treat with estrogen but, uh, and, and female hormones, but we also should look at the sleep apnea part. If you have bad acid reflux, definitely check it out. If you have atrial fibrillation, if you have a CAC score above 100, definitely need to check that out. And the beauty is we can now do this at home, getting really good results, good recommendations. Okay, they can also distinguish between something called obstructive sleep apnea, which is where the, the soft tissues and everything else collapse down the tissue. So it's obstruction of the airway. And then we, the other form of sleep apnea is what we call central sleep apnea, because the brain tells you to breathe. Basal ganglia, the subconscious part of your brain, triggers breathing and triggers your breathing pattern. But if you've had a stroke, if you've got significant hypoxia, if your CO2 levels go up, it's going to wake you up. It's going to affect your breathing. And we've got something called chain stokes breathing, which is where you're taking a few deep, deeper breaths. You start breathing shallower and shallower. You take less breaths. Your CO2 builds up and you stop breathing for a little while and you wake up. And that chain stokes breathing is part of central sleep apnea. And this will tell you whether you've got obstructive sleep apnea, central sleep apnea, mixed sleep apnea, or no sleep apnea. 
And all of those things are so important. And then based on the severity of your symptoms, based on the severity and the duration and the amount it affects you, we can then recommend the Darth Vader, different, stra different strategies, the CPAP, the uh, BiPAP, that kind of thing. However, there is a couple of other recommendations. One of them is taping your nose shut or taping your mouth. Please don't do that. Please don't do that. It may work. But if you are intentionally obstructing your mouth, if you're a mouth breather or intentionally obstructing your nose, if something happens, if you throw up, if you're struggling, if it affects you in a negative way. In my opinion, in my opinion, those forms of treatment are a bad form of treatment. They're a bad form of treatment. Don't do them. Don't do them. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you have big tonsils, if you have big adenoids, we may need to look at that a little bit. But folks, sleep apnea is a real issue. And um, you can go ahead and Google it and you can see how all of that works. But polysomnography, the lab testing may be necessary, but the home oximetry test, which is what the sleep doctor test is, is more than adequate. It really is more than adequate. <clears throat> Part of the way you can begin to treat this, change your sleep position, maybe sleep with pillows between your legs or uh, on your head, you can change some of that. Getting the continuous positive airway pressure, um, the uh, CPAP or the BiPAP, either of those may work. Um, but and obviously, the long-term treatment is to treat insulin resistance, to treat metabolic syndrome, to treat um, uh, um, your obesity. But the surgery, no, 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 no. Not, not in my opinion. That should be a last resort. And I've just seen awfulness with that. Are there medications that can help with sleep apnea? There have been a few that have been tried. None of them really effectively work. None of them really work. Neurostimulation. Unless you've got diaphragm issues or other uh, uh, abnormalities of the nerves, uh, not really necessary. Some of the oral, the, the dentists and the uh, maxillofacial uh, doctors will find mandibular splints. Most people find those uncomfortable to wear. Uh, the na nasal tape, the things that open you up, they may work a little bit. But I'm not certain of the massive benefit of those. Certainly worth trying first. And again, you can repeat this, the sleep doctor test on and off those and it'll give you the measurables. But folks, sleep apnea is not only making your life miserable, it potentially can kill you. It can potentially kill you through a heart attack, through a stroke. You don't want to take that risk. And I guess in the ketogenic metabolic health space, we physicians, I'm going to spank myself on this, we've been remiss in not talking about it louder, in not being more aggressive about talking to our patients about sleep apnea. I already have a lot of patients on CPAP. And the cool part is, as they lose weight, as their metabolic health gets better, they no longer need their machines. But I've chosen to become more aggressive about testing for uh, coronary artery vascular disease, getting CAC scores, because the GPs, family doctor practice, practice doctors who should be doing it are not doing it. And now, because the family practice doctors should be doing these sleep studies, and they're not, now that we have an adequate tool, uh, the sleep doctor tool, um, I'm going to be a strong advocate of at least getting tested. Please leave comments down below. Uh, and, and if you've had success stories of getting off your sleep apnea uh, machines, if, you, if you've gotten rid of your CPAP, I love that. That's what we see every day. But talk to me about your stories. Leave comments. If you disagree with me, leave comments. I do care that you get tested for your sleep apnea. Doesn't matter where, doesn't matter how, but get tested. And if you don't have it, badge of honor. If you do have it, call to action. Let's talk. Throw us a buck at our Patreon account. If you want to visit, uh, visit with me, uh, set up a consult. And I would urge you either get the sleep testing done. And if you're positive, whatever they recommend, let's look at you as a holistic body. Let's treat the insulin resistance. Let's treat the obesity. Give us a shout. Text, call, WhatsApp, anywhere in the world. 561-517-0642. Give us a shout. Let's set up a consultation. Let's discuss your apnea. Let's discuss in the context of who you are as a human being and your general metabolic health. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. I hope this helps.